Okay, uh, let's let's start here, and uh, we have it on the whiteboard here, and on our second computer, it is uh, it's certainly uh, uh, up on the full screen. So let's hope uh, that it's working over in Taj Mahal as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, why uh, biological drinking water treatment is a future necessity, uh, and uh, I'm going to try to go through the presentation relatively quick and um, so that you guys get something to eat. Um, okay, um, this is the Advanced Abrasion Water Treatment Team that I'm working with and um, we've done a lot of work in Aboriginal communities here in Canada. I'm the guy in the middle and uh, team members, some team members are uh, on the side of me there, and my co-authors as well. Oops, sorry. Okay. And uh, the Advanced Aboriginal Water Treatment Team um, is composed of Aboriginal water keepers concerned with the production of truly safe drinking water with the help of science and we have a string of communities that are doing research and having having uh, biological processes in their treatment uh, plants so it's an ongoing uh, affair and the water water that we have to treat is of extremely poor quality and uh, it's not possible to use simply filtration methods to uh, to to uh, produce the high quality water. Uh, we have to use reverse osmosis, like in groundwater, it is to remove uh, the salts and so forth uh, because of um, the, the high salinity, brackish water, uh, full of all kinds of contaminants. And um, the whole, and in surface water, the organics are extremely high, 25 milligrams per liter in one of our locations. And uh, you can you can see here uh, when we split uh, the surface water uh, in half, you can see how poor um, uh, the water is on the left side, on the waste side. Uh, so that's the kind of water we have. So the whole idea for us with the biological treatment is to be, uh, make a biologically stable water uh, that is acceptable for a reverse osmosis uh, treatment. And here you can see one of the sites, uh, Sad Lake Cree Nation, when it's a windy day, the organics foam foam on, on along the shorelines. And uh, here is uh, Yellowquill's uh, past water source on the left, a creek contaminated by municipal waste. And you can see the source water at Yellowquill is on the left. Uh, that's the raw water. And City of Saskatoon's raw water on the right. So the challenges we have in terms of making the one on the left safe for human consumption is quite uh, considerable. And here's just a picture of Canada. We work mainly in Saskatchewan, but are now also expanding and working in Alberta and elsewhere and Manitoba. So central Canada is uh, where we do most of our work. And for us, we, we certainly have very large numbers of particles, microbes, inorganic ions, iron, manganese, arsenic, ammonium, calcium, calcium, magnesium in terms of the brackish water, sulfate, sulfide, dissolved organics. And a key component here is that uh, meeting guidelines is certainly not the only goal, because we are also trying to protect uh, the, the treated water reservoirs, the distribution system, uh, and so forth. And if you look at the chemical approaches that are being used for, uh, for this type of treatment, uh, in surface water we have direct filtration, and groundwater, typically manganese green sand, we use large quantities of treatment and disinfection chemicals and we still have uh, no ability really to meet the Canadian drinking water quality guidelines in many of these communities. And if you also then look at the chemical use, for example, at that lake renation that you saw, uh, the, 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 the lake with the foam, 
Um, there's a 6,000 people community. They use $15,000 worth of chemicals every month in combination with an ultrafiltration process, uh, xenon seaweed. And despite this, a permanent boil water advisory has been called as the equipment cannot produce safe drinking water. And at Saddle Lake, an integrated biological and oral membrane treatment plant is in detailed design now. And we expect uh, chemical use to be less than $1,000 per month and uh, with very high quality drinking water. And here you can see uh, a month's worth of chemicals at uh, Saddle Lake Green Nation and uh, piles of all kinds of different stuff, uh, powdered activated carbon, sulfuric acid, uh, all kinds of coagulants and polymers, a real chemical soup. And the only chemical we will be using at Sad Lake um, uh, when the integrated biological and oral treatment plant is in effect uh, will be chlorine and very low levels of chlorine. So when we go in and try to deal with these water sources uh, using chemical oxidation, uh, you know, we can use air, pure oxygen, ozone, potassium, permanganate, chlorine, and they react with the reduced compounds to form oxidized compounds. The reduced compounds go from a lower to higher oxidation state. For example, iron goes from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. And uh, these oxidized compounds are frequently not soluble and form particles. So anaerobic water that is exposed to air or other of the above chemicals will rapidly become cloudy with most groundwater sources we are working with forming 100 to 500,000 particles per milliliter. And this is a key problem uh, and a key difference between chemical treatment and biological treatment. So here you can see some of those particles. And if you take our raw water sources uh, you can see here the yellow quill raw water source. Uh, now it's a groundwater source. And it's been simply sitting in the bottle, and it's been exposed to air, and it's formed a lot of particles. It's a biotreated bottle next to it, but I'll come to that later. So the conventional treatment problems we have, we have particle formation is time dependent. And it's difficult to remove the particles through media filtration because the particles are more or less like dandruff. They, they are, they are uh, difficult to retain. And we are actually generating at ye Yellow Quill, if we do it with chemical treatment, 50 million particles per milligram of iron per liter. So we have about 10 milligram of iron. Uh, we run three liters a second. Conventional treatment at Yellow Quill will form and then have to remove one and a half billion particles per second. Huge number of particles. And the other problem with conventional treatment is that the addition of chemical oxidants is needing to be too large. That yellow quill potassium permanganate demand is well over 10 milligrams per liter. And a realistic dosage rate for potassium permanganate is really well below five milligrams per liter. So when addition of oxidant is too low, the process is not complete, and that causes challenges in the treated water reservoir and distribution system, or when we use with our NRO, it causes fouling. The other problem with conventional treatment is that the generation, the, well, this is the problem, the generation of these huge amounts of small particles, and they are in the 2 to 40 microns in size, and this makes it really difficult for the media filtration, which results in short filter runs and compromised water quality. And the end result is conventional treatment failure uh, and causing a lot of problems. There is another problem with conventional treatment. The oxidative treatments have one other thing in common, which is the breakup of organic compounds into smaller compounds. This makes it easier for bacteria to use the organic compounds, and the water is becoming more biologically unstable. There is more food for bacteria. So instead of improving the quality of the water in, in, in that regard, 
even if it isn't in any guidelines, it is going to cause us problems in, in the distribution system or treated water reservoirs. And conventional treatment, therefore, results in the formation of excessive quantities of particles combined with making dissolved organic material more bioavailable, as well as moving the redox potential into greater than 400 millivolt, causing the formation of manganese oxidizing bacterial biofilm, as well as some other biofilms that we would not have if we did not allow those conditions to be established. And here you just see some shots of uh, distribution system fouling. Um, and while we have many communities that are getting uh, just filtered water and really poor quality water, uh, humans are certainly more tolerant than RO membranes. If you stick an RO membrane after a poorly treated water, you will end up with trouble uh, right away because an RO basically stops everything. And the problems that you're having with conventional treatment ahead of RO membranes and the same problem you do have in the distribution systems if you don't have an RO, um, it is that you have bacteria forming slime layers uh, on the membrane sheets, uh, loss of productivity even at, even at low increase in the weight of the membranes, decreased membrane life, increased maintenance and cleaning, and they had three new sets of membranes in three uh, years at George Gorgon on water treatment plant. This is extremely costly for these communities. And you can see here are our pre-filters after chemical oxidation. They look pretty grubby. And uh, here you see an RO membrane. Uh, and uh, just uniformly uh, contaminated um, from the poor quality uh, pretreatment. Now, when the difference here now, we come over to biological filtration. And while I feel it's a key to future water treatment. Uh, I, I have uh, taken a lot of chemistry courses and done a lot of chemical work, and when we see that we generate a, million and a, half, a billion and a half particles per liter per second at yellow quail, um, I don't think uh, we as chemists uh, are ever going to get those types of solutions perfected. There is always going to be challenges to, to, to do that. And that's why biological filtration comes in and has at least a chance of dealing with these extremely poor quality water issues. Now, you never allow reduced compounds from becoming physically or chemically oxidized in biological filtration. Therefore, we have no production of particles. The bacteria will take these dissolved compounds, oxidize them, and retain them within their cells. They gain energy. They gain nutrients in the process. The biologically oxidized compounds are stored inside the bacterial cells or in secretions around the cell. And that results in at least in an order of magnitude lower head loss versus a chemical process. Now, we always all then remove the bioavailable compounds and never allow the generation of new bioavailable compounds. That is another key. So in the actual treatment process, we are not going in and generating new bioavailable compounds. And now, to determine how you should be dealing with water and if it's suitable for biological treatment or not, you need to get really good data from from the site. You need to run the run the wells, uh, the raw water, so that you you are sure that you got into the aquifer and and that is the water that uh, you you will be treating, uh, and, and so it's not something that's sat in a pipe somewhere. And the entire key also to biological treatment is you pull it out of the ground, you take it out of a surface water. You don't stick it in any containers. You don't stick it in. Uh, you don't dump it in in a reservoir and then try to treat it. Everything should be taken out of the ground or taken out of a surface water, 
and within seconds you start the biological treatment. Uh, so on site you need then good data for oxygen, redox, uh, temperature of the raw water is a key factor and, and good temperature measurements is sometimes hard to come by because uh, I've seen a lot of temperature measurements that simply don't make any sense. So you know you have to you have to have uh, good data for that. And then you you just have to take uh, samples so you can get good information on the nutrients, the metals, and everything else in the water. And uh, here in Canada, certainly we use uh, an, analytic, an analytical lab that does they are doing plasma scans and so forth. So we have a really good fingerprint of of what we do have in the water, and then we can start to look at it uh, from. Uh, bacteria's point of view. If I was a bacteria, what would I do with this water? And uh, and this is uh, what uh, you then going to end up with. Instead of the formation to the right of these particles, uh, the bacteria grab a hold of the uh, reduced compounds, and you form no particles. And on the left side, so that is totally the key to biological groundwater treatment. So transforming anaerobic groundwater, you know water is pumped out of the ground containing no oxygen anaerobic with reduced forms of many compounds such as iron. Water is clear. Air and water introduced into the biological filters where bacteria oxidize the iron and the water remains clear. No particles are formed. And typically in a biological treatment plant, you have your well pump, and it should be driving the entire process. All you have in the plant is filters, and if you have an RO, you after the filters, the RO booster pump will pick up the water, and it goes straight through the RO, and it's uh, processed, and it's not until you have finished processing this water that uh, it is dumped into the treated water reservoir, and uh, the process is over, so no intermediate dumping anywhere. And the biological processes are controlled by ensuring that the right oxygen and redox conditions for each contaminant removal is maintained in the filters. The final goal is to have a biologically stable water that will not promote further growth of bacteria. Uh, if you don't use ROs and so forth, that is the kind of water that you can distribute in your uh, distribution system uh, without ending up with the challenging problems that are now being raised by mycobacteria and other types of pathogenic organisms thriving in distribution systems around the world. That's going to be the next key issue in drinking water treatment. And even if the regulators haven't caught up to it yet, they will catch up to it because it's causing a lot of problems. And really the only way to get rid of those types of problems is to make sure that uh, you are not putting out any biologically available compounds in the distribution system because if we have no uh, biologically available compounds put out, these biofilms of mycobacteria, legionella, etc., they simply cannot uh, exist. And if you try to just kill them with chlorine, I'm sorry, you're going to be out of luck because they're slow growing, they're highly tolerant to chlorine, and you will find them basically in any distribution system which is, is supplying the distribution system with bioavailable water. Now in Canada we started in uh, 2002 with our uh, uh, first uh, pilots and so forth, the yellow quill. Uh, pilot, uh, you can see low temperatures we have in Canada, and um, and now after three years, uh, we first the Alaquil, then Pasqua, then Gordons, and now the federal government, the Indian, uh, the Department of the Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, is basically considering the integrated biological and RO treatment as the best available technology and uh, we are now just busy uh, running around uh, doing pilots, putting in water treatment, uh, new water treatment plants. Miskaugan, that's the groundwater, it's a retrofit. Mosquito grizzly by head, Lean Man First Nation, it's groundwater retrofit. Dakota Dunes is a resort uh, groundwater retrofit. 
uh, white cap first nation groundwater new satellite Cree nation surface water new we're running now up to 500 gallons per minute and uh, if we now look at cost compared to conventional treatment um, new construction cost is similar to conventional system construction but operational costs are typically less than half of con conventional and the water quality that you get out of it is far superior now if it comes to retrofits any properly designed conventional filtration system can be directly converted to biological filtration without additional filtration capacity operational costs will drop to less than half of prior costs and the water quality will be far, far higher. Here you just see a new construction, here you see a retrofit where it's very simple to do retrofits, take out the material, the manganese green sand, uh, put uh, new underdrain uh, gravel and so forth underneath and fill it up with uh, desired um, uh, filter light uh, material and um, to actually get it active what we did here this is Dakota Dunes and it was just uh, commissioned uh, we uh, we have three filters and we took uh, two filters out of line and we were running the manganese green sun through the third filter um, and while we emptied the other ones filled them with filter light material and then we uh, put uh, raw water into the into the filters, uh, pressurized them, and left them for 10 days or so. And uh, then, when when we had, uh, we also ran a bit of water through them. And when we established that the iron bacteria were capable of removing uh, the iron, we just switched the system, and uh, the two first two filters for producing water into the RO and we then changed out uh, filter number three so absolutely no stop in terms of production of water for the community and uh, sure we will not get uh, nitrification uh, uh, at this earlier state, uh, stage uh, but that just will have some a little bit more management in terms of the RO membranes uh, uh, because of that but not a big deal and if you look at the effectiveness of biological filtration on the key parameters that we are removing, ammonium. Ammonium's got to be a key because if you have more than 0 0.3 milligrams of ammonium before you chlorinate your water, you will ha use 5 milligrams of chlorine to get rid of it and anything more than 0 0.3 and we are typically always dealing with 1 to 5 milligrams of ammonium then chlorinating away the problem with ammonium is really not a solution and we get consistency more than 98 percent removal of ammonium uh, through the biological filtration process uh, arsenic removal is uh, a bit variable but uh, the reason for that when we are not worrying about it uh, the key thing is that arsenic gets arsenic 3 plus gets converted to arsenic 5 plus which is 100 percent removed by the membranes uh, and dissolved organics are typically low removal rates but there is a proviso here the very low levels of organic carbon we pull out that's the kind of organic carbon that is really problematic to the membranes or to your distribution system it's the bioavailable carbon so you've got to pull that out uh, phosphate is a bit variable as well it's a nutrient for bacteria and uh, if we allow this water to become oxidized form particles we're removing virtually all of the particles um, so we tested a lot of different types of material and uh, plastic material granule activated carbon expanded clay and um, in in our mind certainly filter light uh, is uh, way above the crowd when it comes to to uh, its uh, ability to do what we needed to do. Now, if you look at filter light material, it looks like coffee grounds. Some of some of the of, of, of the ones, anyways, and it provides a hotel for the bacteria. That I mean, any biological attachment material. That's really all you want to do. You want to provide a means for the bacteria to attach, so they can sit in the water stream. These are bacteria that stick hard to the 
material, the attachment material, they are not in the water, uh, and um, and they are doing their business from their where they're sitting, from the biofilm they formed. And what you need to do in a biological treatment plant, you need to provide the right conditions. And iron bacteria will remove iron. Nitrifying bacteria will, will oxidize ammonium, etc. And here you can see how the uh, bacteria are attached to the filter light material. And uh, you still don't want a totally covered uh, thing uh, because you want water to go around the bacteria and so forth. Um, so the biological attachment material that you're going to use. I, the attachment material should provide a high level of available surface area for bacteria to settle and work from. If the available surfaces provide too little space for bacteria, there will be less purification power. And the material should have low loss rates. So the attrition rates when you backwash should be low. And the material should have favorable backwashing characteristics because you actually now depend on moving the excess bacteria off your off your material that's how you backwash and and if you when you backwash if you backwash too much of the population then then you will have an initial start up uh, thing again where the effectiveness of the filters are not not as good as they could be and again uh, filter light shines in this respect so the biological attachment material, uh, the different kinds I've just listed again, and some even include sand. We have slow sand filters, probably one of the most efficient ways of, of doing anything biologically. Um, but uh, the bottom line with all of this is uh, you need the you need the, you need the area the surface area to, for them to attach to but you need several other conditions as well if you want to optimize the process. And that's why granular activated carbon is a bit of a problem because typically you have really big rooms, uh, hotel rooms, or you have very small ones. And the very small ones, uh, there is simply not enough, for, even if a bacteria can get in there, there is not enough water circulation around them for them to do uh, a good uh, uh, process, a lot of material. and um, and filter light too, they have an extensive product line suitable for most biological treatment applications. And we selected the filter light after having tested all of the above, well except sand. Now if we look at the actual processes of biological treatment, what can we do? We can only do things that bacteria would like to uh, take, uh, have use of. So it's got to be an energy source, or it's got to be a nutrient, or the bacteria are really not interested in it. Uh, so with iron, we have oxidation of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. Now, if you actually oxidize iron and get it into Fe3 plus, the bacteria, aerobic bacteria, are really not interested anymore. It's like having a fire, and then you you dig out the ashes. Uh, from the fire and try to make another fire with the ashes. It just isn't going to happen. Uh, arsenic, uh, we, it's also used as an energy source. Uh, arsenic 3 goes to arsenic 5. That's uh, quite useful, uh, even if it isn't all removed. And arsenate is actually also similar to phosphate, and sometimes bacteria confuse uh, the uh, ars arsenate with uh, phosphate and take it up uh, inadvertently. And if you want full arsenic removal biologically, <coughs> you have to play around with, with some of these things. You, you may have to add some phosphorus. Uh, the ammonium, uh, the oxidation to nitrate, uh, we, we were certainly one of the first ones to do that extremely effectively at very low temperatures running temperatures of 5 centigrade and we're running a pilot now where we are running it at 4 centigrade and it looks as another one is coming up at 3 centigrade. So we are pushing the limit when it comes to really cold water and uh, I, that's why I think in, in India you, you are maybe pushing the limit in terms of really warm water and anything uh, working in at warmer temperatures with biological treatment should work much better 
uh, because all processes are faster, biological processes are faster the warmer the temperature. That's why when we have water treatment plants and their groundwater is 10 centigrade, we will need less of a biological uh, community to deal with that compared to the ones at 5 centigrade. So I certainly prefer to work at 10 centigrade than 5 centigrade, but it is possible to do it at any temperature if you encourage the right bacteria. Uh, sulfide is another one. You get hydrogen sulfide in your uh, groundwater, and that is also very rapidly converted to sulfate by uh, bacteria, because and these E and N energy or nutrients. So you see that most of them can be uh, energy sources and a nutrient source, uh, except phosphorus is really just uh, phosphate is really just a, a nutrient source, and. Um, Sometimes you hear that uh, you only need to remove iron down to whatever the guidelines states, uh, like 350 micrograms or so in uh, Canada, and that is really foolhardy because uh, iron is a major problem uh, for the water treatment reservoir, distribution system, and if you have RO membranes, if you cannot pull the iron down to well below 50 micrograms per liter, it's just about game over for you because any iron that you are putting into a membrane, if it's now oxidized water, any iron going into a membrane will not come out. It will stick on the waste side of the membrane and it's an enormously good catalyst. And so if you have any other stuff in there, you're going to burn hole on, holes on the membranes and that's one of the big problems with having conventional treatment ahead of membranes. So arsenic, um, you know, we Arsenic-3 is really not removed by membranes effectively, 5 to 60 percent removal, but biological treatment, if it doesn't take it out, it still converts it and makes use of the energy, uh, so it gets it to arsenic-5+, plus, which is 100 percent removed basically by membranes. And with the ammonium, oxidation to nitrate, your key here, each part of ammonium requires up to 15 parts of chlorine to get rid of it and ammonium is not well removed by membrane, so we really like to remove the, the ammonium uh, ahead of the membranes, especially if there is any damage to the membranes, their ability to remove ammonium is basically gone. And ammonium, there is not that many things that you can do with ammonium in terms of its removal. You can use chlorine, or you can use biological filtration, or you can avoid use it using chlorination as your primary disinfectant. So but that causes a string of other problems. Now, when you have biological reactors, the conditions in each filter must be carefully controlled for the desired contaminant removal. So we typically run three filters in series, and each of those filters have totally different conditions in them. Uh, that, that will give us the iron removal, it will give us the nitrification, will give us the bio available DOC removal and arsenic removal, and it will also give us robustness. Uh, we could do it in two filters, uh, but uh, then we would sacrifice some of the robustness of the process. Now, if you don't want to take, do a certain biological process, say for example manganese oxidation, if you don't want to go there, um, you should then control your water treatment process so that the conditions are not set up for the manganese oxidizing bacteria to take over. And uh, that unfortunately is exactly what conventional treatments do. They move the conditions in the water right into the, into the area where manganese oxidizing bacteria like to be. So man does something that, uh, that uh, nature wouldn't do, and that causes a lot of problems, distribution system problems, membrane problems, and so forth. Now, if you, you select filter light material correctly, and you can provide for highly stable conditions for the removal of the different contaminants, uh, and with all the other benefits in terms of backwash, etc. That shouldn't be too complex for the operators to 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 do, and still have really really good rates right off the backwashing. And here you see one of our original setups at Yellowquill. 
But as I've told you, you need to control the different uh, conditions in each filter so your application of air may be only in the beginning or it may be in the beginning, biofilter 1, or you may have another one at biofilter 2 or even at biofilter 3. So what you play around with really is making sure that the oxygen conditions are right exactly for what you want it to do. That's the key. You can see some bio, yeah, same as any conventional filter. Um, and uh, because we have effective contaminant removals with low filter head loss, means we have low backwash and water use. Typically, in groundwater situations, uh, less than 5% of the backwash water is used uh, uh, compared to manganese green sand. And uh, run times are ten, more than 10 times longer than what you can get with conventional treatment. And you see Aliquil was quite a small plant, and uh, this is a distribution system backwash. Uh, so what we have now tried to, to say is we have terrible water here. In fact, I've been in Thailand, I've been in China, and looked at water in those places. I have yet to find any of those places have poorer quality water than we have in terms of the chemistry and the organics in there. Microbially, yes, there can be challenges, but uh, uh, anyway, so we need to have extremely effective processes to be able to get this, these really poor quality water sources that are simply too poor for conventional treatment ever to succeed. So that's the kind of water. There is nobody can treat this with chemistry successfully if they want to have an RO system after it. So that's uh, what we are doing. And, and the entire goal here is for us to to treat the water so that the membrane will not get fouled up. And distribution and membrane fouling cleaning requirements decrease. You actually will find that even if you have conventional treatment and an RO, 50% of the BOD uh, may go right through even the tightest of an RO membrane. So that's why I, I still believe this is going to become a necessity because we don't want that microbial growth in the distribution system. And you can get that even if you use tight RO membranes, which is kind of amazing because 99% removal of sodium, a very small ion, and only 50% removal of some of these uh, BOD compounds, you know, low molecular weight uh, water-soluble compounds. Uh, how they get through, nobody really knows, but they do. Um, the other positive thing in terms of our treatment, biological treatment produces a biologically stable, high quality water for RO treatment. The operational cost decrease, treated water quality increases, and the environmental footprint decreases. Now I showed you the pre-filters of the conventional treatment. And here you see pre-filters after RO treatment. Uh, the operators change in every three to four months, just has something to do, but I'm sure they could run them for a year without any problems. That's the kind of quality we produce through the biological filters. Uh, here you see uh, yellow quail iron, eight and a half, down to less than 30 micrograms per liter, arsenic, uh, at that time, the uh, detection levels were only five. Now it's a lot better. Ammonium totally removed. Uh, most of the phosphate, the phosphorus is removed, um, and dissolved organics. At low removal rates, but of course the, it removes the key compounds, the bioavailable compounds. We don't touch manganese in this process, and uh, we take it out uh, on the membranes. And in terms of the dissolved solids, we remove them with the membranes, of course, too. Um, just to give you some setting here, here you have uh, the operators at Yellowquill. And at Gordon First Nation, here we have a conventional treatment plant that switched from manganese green sand to biological filtration in December 2005. In the conventional plant, 10 filter backwashes per day has now gone to two filter backwashes every two weeks. So 100 filter backwashes per year instead of 3,600. 
backwash water uh, has decreased to 0 0.4 million liters from 23 million liters, and backwash labor has decreased to 40 from 1,440 hours per year. It was a full-time job, and this, these were had, they had five filters there. Full-time job to just do backwashing, and long hours for the operators uh, to, to try to accomplish the other things that he needed to do in the plant. And the water was of such poor quality that the RO cleanings uh, ended up being every day. And now, uh, since switching to biological treatment, uh, we really haven't cleaned the membranes. Uh, so there is no need to replace membranes every eight months. We predict 10 years. In fact, we're supplying membranes to Gordon's and uh, I've given them a 10-year warranty on the RO membranes. So no, mem no membrane damage, there's no iron that's being caught and becoming a catalyst within the membranes. And biological treatment requires no chemicals. Antiscalant requirements have decreased several fold and switching to biological treatment has resulted in cost savings of more than $100,000 per year for this community or 1,200 people. So the reason we save so much money here is that they had such a big problem with their process, they had to replace membranes and, and so forth. Otherwise, cost savings would not be this huge. But you also got to think about it that they could only run brand new membranes for less than a month and then the membranes were damaged, and then you started to have poor quality water in the distribution system. You couldn't retain the ammoniums. So you were not disinfecting properly. So it is actually the problems are greater than even just replacing membranes every eight months. Here you see the, their biofilters, and here you see the membrane scared. And uh, again, now with bio, biological removal, all iron is gone. Uh, arsenic levels are 72, ranging between 70 and 85 micrograms per liter. It's taken down below 15 micrograms uh, biologically. Uh, ammonium removed, uh, phosphorus removed, dissolved organic low level removal. Manganese not touched, but very high manganese levels that are, of course, totally removed by the membranes. And here's Bob. Uh, He's the operator there. He's a member of our advanced Aboriginal water treatment team. So the development that we came up with in the end was an integrated biological and RO treatment process, the IBROM process. Biological filtration, and remember here now, biological filtration can only remove compounds that are either a nutrient or an energy source to bacteria. The goal is to remove all such compounds so that no further bacterial growth can occur in the membranes or in the distribution system. And reverse osmosis membrane treatment will then remove most compounds without plugging or fouling. After membrane treatment, it is desirable to add calcium and magnesium back into the water, and that's what we also do. The oral membranes remove manganese and any remaining uh, ammonium and arsenic ions, while our membranes, even at yellow quail, we cannot tell the difference between a brand new membrane. We pulled them out uh, and tested them. We cannot tell the difference between a brand new membrane and a membrane that's been uh, for six years at Yellow Quill. That's how well we have treated the water. And when the membranes are not damaged, they will certainly also remove uh, quite a bit of ammonium, uh, although we now don't have any ammonium for it to see. But any remaining particles and dissolved solids, etc. Et and this demineralized water goes through a calcium and magnesium bed before distribution. Now, if you look at the tap water, uh, we, we uh, yeah, you can see some of the kind no ammonium, arsenic very low, and not detectable, dissolved organics very low, so no, no uh, organic disinfection byproducts. Actually, trihalomethanes are below detection, uh, manganese very low, nitrate low, a um, little bit of nitrate there. Um, but uh, what's happening with the nitrate is it's, it, it, 
it certainly can go through membranes to some extent, and uh, some is taken up biologically uh, by, by the bacteria, but we will have some traces of nitrate always. So trihalomethane is below detection. And now, one thing that the WHO is recommending is that uh, for RO treated water, we got to increase the calcium and magnesium alkalinity and hardness and TDS of the water. So they've said, here are the recommended le levels for demineralized plants. And you can see calcium is uh, just above the recommended le level and hardness is, alkalinity is. Magnesium is a bit lower, but we have now changed the composition of uh, our, our contactor, and we are now up to recommended levels as well. So the conclusion here, biological treatment can replace conventional treatment with little need for chemicals. Following the biological treatment, reverse osmosis treatment can make salt water drinkable. Distributed water is biologically stable. There is little opportunity for bacteria to grow in the distribution system, and there is virtually no chlorine in demand. Chlorine levels at treatment plants similar to distribution end. Uh, life cycle costs are much reduced. We really have a choice. We can either grow the bacteria in the water treatment plant, or they will grow in the distribution system. Safe drinking water is a must for healthy communities. So you see native community at George Gordon, First Nation. Uh, Yellow Quill was invited to present uh, our work uh, at, uh, at Yellow Quill to the United Nations in 2005. You see the operator on the right who presented at the UN and uh, taking you to George Gordon, First Nation, where is a powwow uh, celebra celebrating. Uh, uh, different uh, things, very colorful costumes, and uh, I hope that you have some time and visit our website at safewater.org, uh, and our sponsors, Alberta Ecotrust, for these webinars, Alberta Ecotrust, uh, Canadian Superstore, Sapphire Group, and the Royal Bank uh, Foundation. And that's the end of the presentation. And I'm now going to switch uh, the, uh, the blackboard uh, or whiteboard off so that we can interact and you guys can ask me questions. So I'm hoping that uh, Rayat, you can see you can see this now. No. Just one second. Oh, okay, good, good. Uh, uh, Rajat, I'm going to uh, turn the microphone over to you. Can I? I'll click on you and turn mine off. So, Rajat, maybe you could say something. That is answer right now. Um, uh, any questions uh, to Hans? Thank you for now. It is not fast on the picture now. It's very clear. Okay. 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 I want to know how much is the cost for uh, ozonization and protection plant in the day approved for a fixed MGD plant because we got one day from the human to day back in 94 uh, for the removal of ammonia and the uh, nitrates. Okay. Modern. Just please. 
Did you hear that, Thomas? No, I can't actually hear. So if you could, uh, if you could type it out for me, I can, I can respond to it. Um, <laughs> that's going to be tough for me to to uh, give give you uh, give give you a cost on on that. Uh, you know, you actually you need to you need to figure out um, what is the temperature uh, and uh, how much iron do you have there, and you've got to, you you really you really need to get uh, a good um, assessment of. Um, of, of the water that you're trying to treat, and and then you you basically need to figure out uh, how fast, how rapid can you uh, run this process. Uh, but say if you if you look at it from the point of view, you're going to go in there with a conventional process and do it. Uh, the biological process in terms of filtration capacity and everything else will be very much similar. And and uh, the difference is that you're using biological material instead of uh, uh, a biological attachment material instead of something else, and uh, you would then be far more effective in the removal as well. Um, so switching to biological or constructing a biological treatment plant will definitely not be any more expensive than constructing a conventional treatment plant. But for you to to for and it may be actually considerably cheaper. Particularly, I would say in India, chances are it will be cheaper because you have um, uh, because you have higher warmer uh, temperatures in the water. Okay. Any other questions or Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, hi Rajat. Uh, no, I I really can't hear what you guys are saying. So what I'm what I'm thinking is that if you type out your questions and then hopefully you can hear me and uh, I can respond to them. And uh, and one of the things like yeah, that's great. And I will just keep talking a little bit uh, until I see a question pop up, and then if you guys tell me to to be quiet, then I, I uh, I'll, I'll do that too. Uh, when you when you uh, look at uh, um, a new supply and decide whether you're going to use and how you're going to use biological treatment, you get your chemistry in order. You get you get your um, analysis and you get your on-site analysis. Very important that you go out. And uh, have the engineering company or wherever uh, get good data, flow the well good, uh, and and get uh, the water that the filters are going to see uh, once you come into full production. 
and uh, that you then have to have as your basis uh, for for your process to set up what conditions you you need to establish. Uh, it took uh, before we actually figured this out. Um, I spent 20 months at Yellowquill on at the well site and did uh, hundreds of experiments. And so we started to then learn how to deal with uh, uh, this type of water. And then the next one took six months, and and the following one. Um, took three months, and now we have actually are doing systems without even going in and doing a pilot. Like Dakota Dunes was done without a pilot, but we did do uh, some extensive uh, work on the water coming in. Uh, so uh, we knew it was uh, somewhat similar to the three other plants that we had. And I really think in terms of you guys in India that it would be really good to, to uh, set, up, set up some pilots and get the, the basic parameters uh, down in, in terms of how you should, uh, what type of rates you, you can get. And, and like I said, if I see uh, this uh, chemical analysis and done properly, and I'd be happy to share with you what we are analyzing for to do it. And uh, and if you then have some examples of uh, uh, the kinds of water sources, the kind of temperatures that you have, uh, then uh, I'd be happy to sit down and say, yeah, we got to worry about this, we got to worry about that, and this is how we should be. Uh, approaching it, and it also depends what you want to get out of it. What what is it you want to get get uh, removed uh, from this water, and and so forth. And typically, I mean, if you actually look at some competitors or whatever, if you will, like Degramont, uh, you know, they have different types of processes, like the ferrazur process, mangazur, nitrosur, and then that type of stuff. Um, from our point of view, here in Canada and the waters that we work. We have all the problems that you can basically expect in a in a drinking water in a raw water source. So it's not we have arsenic always. We have ammonium always in the anaerobic wells, anyways, and uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, we have high levels of organics. Um, so we we do have all of that stuff. So it's not even an issue for us to go in with one little process, say ferrazur, and, and think that we have treated the water. That's why we've, we've standardized when we do this. We do three filters. We, do, uh, we, we truly form a water that, is not, uh, that has no biological activity left in it. And in fact, uh, at uh, Yellowquill, I um, gave uh, a bottle of water to both to the engineering company uh, that we were working with and to the federal government uh, person. And that was in um, s September 2002. And you can look at that, those bottles that they have in their offices uh, today, and there's absolutely uh, no difference. So, so, so they, um, they literally are biologically stable. And I think a very... Okay. Okay, so I think we should uh, wrap it up and I hope you guys have a really nice supper and uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, talking to you guys again in the future. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, e you can email them to me, and uh, we can try to take it from there. Have a wonderful evening and nice supper. I'm really jealous of you because I love curries. Take care. Bye-bye.